assure you that what you will observe is a vast wasteland. Is a small triumph. And uncorrupted communication. Hello, I am Michael Stoll, Professor and Chairman of the Department of Communication at UCSB. Our guest today is Sheila Watt-Cloutier. She is Chair of the Inuit Circumpolar Conference, an international NGO representing the Inuit across the Arctic in Canada, Greenland, Alaska, and in Russia. She is the current representative of the Inuit on the Arctic Council and was instrumental in the establishment of the 2001 Stockholm Convention on Persistent Organic Pollutants. She lives in northern, she was born in northern Quebec and was raised traditionally in her early years before attending school in southern Canada and in Churchill, Manitoba. She has an educational background in counseling, education, and human development. She has received numerous awards from around the world. Recently, she received the inaugural Global Environmental Award from the World Association of Non-Governmental Associations in recognition of her work. She is also a recipient in 2005 of the Champion of the Earth Award from the United Nations Environmental Program. Today we are pleased to have the opportunity to talk with Sheila Watt-Cloutier about the Inuit Circumpolar Conference, the Arctic Climate Impact Assessment, uh, the POPs Agreement, and global organizing to protect the environment. So Sheila, welcome to UCSB. Thank you for having me. Let's talk about the ICC, the Inuit Circumpolar Conference. How, could, how would you best describe it, what it is and what role it plays? Well, the Inuit Circumpolar Conference was created back in the uh, late 70s in Alaska, USA, by Eben Hobson, a visionary and Inuk, uh, to protect the interests and the rights of Inuit of the world. And he thought that since we are so few in number in the world that we better unite. We live in Alaska, in Canada, in Greenland, and Chukotka, Siberia and we total 155,000 in the world. And so the Inuit Circumpolar Conference is a non-governmental organization that protects an, uh, the interests and the rights of Inuit internationally. You've said in the past that the role at ICC can be summed up by saying that we do nothing more than remind the world that the Arctic is not a barren land devoid of life, but a rich and majestic land that has yes. supported our resilient cu culture. Being 155,000 Inuit in a world of billions make, makes this a daunting task. That's right. So how do you do this? Well, uh, with a great deal of challenge. Because <laughs> very few people in the world, uh, more, a little more know about the Arctic now and our people, but uh, very few really do know who we are in the Arctic, being so few in number and so far from everybody's view. However, um, people are starting to make the linkages and, and to understand. So, but few people know much less what globalization is doing and having a negative impact on our world. We are part of um, the global community in terms of uh, we have the observer status on the United Nations to be able to address these issues. Uh, we are able to attend, of course, as permanent participants at the Arctic Council meetings. And there are lots of invitations for speaking engagement. So we do have a place in which we are uh, attempting to have our voice heard all around the world. Well, one of, those, one of those places where you had a significant impact in having your voice heard was in the build-up and the development of the Arctic Climate Impact Assessment. Right. Um, perhaps you could tell our viewers what the Ar Arctic Impact Environment Assessment is and mm -hmm. how, how, you, how that role was played. Right. Well, the Arctic Climate Impact Assessment is work that was started under the auspices of the Arctic Council, which is the eight-nation council that was created back in 1995. Um, and we, as ICC, Inuit Circumpolar Conference, are one of six permanent participants. There are six uh, indigenous organizations that live in the circumpolar world that act as not voting members, but we are there at the table negotiating 
whatever it is that needs to be dealt with on, in terms of sustainable development that affects the Arctic and its people. Uh, the Arctic Climate Impact Assessment is an assessment that was created there knowing that the issues of global warming and climate changes were huge for the people of the Arctic. The Arctic is now considered the health barometer for the planet. It is the early warning. What is happening to the planet is happening first in the Arctic. And because we, the Inuits, um, our culture is based, the Inuits culture is based on um, cold, the ice and the snow, we are witnessing the melting of this planet at the minute levels, at the most minute levels. So when the Arctic Climate Impact Assessment was started, we played a big role in making sure that it was going to go ahead. Uh, it, involves about 300, it involved about 300 scientists from 15 countries. The United States played a very key role in this. The chair was an American, Bob Carell, uh, from Harvard. And we made sure that this assessment was going to be different from any other assessment. It was not just to be a science assessment. There was going to be policy recommendations with this assessment. It was going to involve Western science as well as traditional knowledge. And it was going to involve not only the impacts that it would have uh, environmentally and economically, but also socially and culturally. And that is groundbreaking on those levels. So we were part of the planning, we were part of the drafting, we were part of this, uh, this assessment throughout the entire process. Yes, I think one of the most fascinating parts of that assessment is this point that, that the traditional science, traditional people and the Western scientists um, and all global scientists uh, were doing the investigation side by side. Um, perhaps we could talk a little more about what the contributions were mm -hmm. uh, from the traditional people. Right. Well, you know, our hunters and our elders who are out on the land every single day, as I say, are there. We are still very much a hunting culture. So all our hunters and elders who are there every day witness at the very minute levels changes to this environment. And so they brought with it to this assessment changes to uh, the conditions of the ice and what they observe, conditions to changes that are happening to the permafrost, uh, to the way in which the ice is forming and how thin it has become over the years. Uh, they, are, they also are witnessing uh, beach slumping and coastal erosion. There are new species of animals that have arrived in the Arctic that we have not seen, animals, fish, insects. Uh, and even the flora is changing where there used to be just tundra, there are shrubs that are now growing in certain places. There's lots of changes that are going on in the Arctic that only the, the real seasoned hunters that are out on the land, on the ice, and the water every day can bring to that process. It's mm -hmm. just about scientists who come up for very brief periods of time and then leave again. We, we often say the scientists that are like our geese, they come up in the spring and they leave in the fall. So, uh, but our hunters can add such value to this process, and they have done so. And, and what impact do you think the assessment has had on, on both the policy level as well as the perceptual level of the, not simply the right. scientists and the, and the people who live there, but right. the rest of us? Sure. Well, when the assessment came out, um, the world was quite shocked because there had been such a void for a long time on Arctic research especially in terms of climate change. We had some good, solid science that we had been building up on the persistent organic pollutants issue that end up in the Arctic sink and ultimately in the cord blood and nursing milk of our mothers at high levels. But we did not have the same kind of rich science for climate change. When that came out, and, and this is the most comprehensive, detailed assessment of climate change in the world to date, and it is on the circumpolar Arctic. So. Yes, people were shocked around the world to, to see because the predictions are, are quite stark in terms of um, what will happen if we don't address this issue head on in terms of uh, lowering greenhouse gas emissions as quickly as possible. What do we have to do now to make sure that happens? There's lots of things that need to be done. The follow-up, the, the, because one of the things, as I said, the Arctic Climate Impact Assessment is different, is that it wasn't just going to be a science piece. There was a policy recommendations that would be attached to it. And although we had major challenges in trying to get that forward, uh, because some of the rules of the game started to be changed midway through, uh, we have powerful countries like the United States that are resistant to making any of the changes that would affect their economic policies. So the challenge 
challenges still exist today. And so the follow-up to the Arctic Climate Impact Assessment is still at that place of challenge. We need to continuously press the uh, United States government to do the right thing in terms of addressing um, not only the policies, but to also becoming, um, on, to come on board with the global community in terms of making sure that it is a team player. And that goes not just for the Arctic Climate Impact Assessment, but for the work that is done globally under the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. There is lots there that needs to get addressed in terms of everybody coming on board to be a player. And one of the places that I know that you speak out about this problem often is in the Arctic Council. Mm -hmm. um, and you mentioned how it's formed and, and its members. Um, how, does, how does it operate on a, on, a, on a regional and also daily basis? Right. Well, the Arctic Council was created to deal with its main focus to be the sustainable development of the circumpolar world of which the eight nations are, you know, have the membership of and we the permanent participants, the indigenous peoples of the eight countries, which includes Inuit, Aleut, Athabascan, Gwich'in, the Sami, and the Russian peoples, uh, uh, the indigenous peoples of Russia. We are there to ensure that the, Arct the, the indigenous voice is there. It's a consensus-based Arctic Council, meaning all of the, the countries have to agree on any work plan, any, any movement that happens within that council is consensus-based. That has its challenges. That really has its challenges. So we tested it during that work of the Arctic Climate Impact Assessment, and we continue to test it because it gets paralyzed. If one country doesn't agree to move forward on certain things, then it can't move forward. So it has its limitations. And so we will continue to test the council to ensure that the important issues that are addressed for the Arctic and its peoples are going to be able to move ahead. Mm -hmm. are there it any, has its limitations. It, well, I understand that, and, mm -hmm. and, and as do all consensual building organizations. Um, are there any particular areas where you have are more likely to have success than others in, within the council? There is. There, there are, you know, there's been some incredible work that has been done under the uh, the Arctic Council, not only the Arctic Climate Impact Assessment, but the Human Development Report uh, is important issues that really deal with issues of, of the challenges that the community is facing. And there are other sustainable development endeavors that have been brought forward by the Arctic Council that, you know, that I guess in a, in a sense are not such a big threat to any uh, big policies that certain governments don't want to, to make changes to. Um, have been very effective. And I'm not suggesting that the Arctic Council is totally ineffective. What I'm suggesting is that in certain very important areas it has proven to be not as effective as it should and could be. But there are areas, uh, the sub-working groups, for example, that work on very specific areas um, are, are what gives strength to the Arctic Council and to many people who work within that that are so committed to making it a better world in the Arctic for the Arctic countries and its people. So there, there's, there's good things going there as well, going on there as well. And I don't want to put you on the, on the political spot, and, but is it, is it a, a consistent um, uh, set of uh, working relationships amongst the indigenous people as well as, as the, as the uh, nations that are represented? That is, do you split? Um, in mm -hmm. caucus, or do you work independently in terms of meeting with the with the nations? Well, um, between ourselves as permanent participants, we have what we call the Indigenous Peoples Secretariat that is based in Copenhagen. Mm -hmm. So the Indigenous peoples always have a very strong working relationship with one another. So that is very uh, uniform and, and very solid. There, there may be times where we, uh, we understand that there are certain differences between mm -hmm. The, the countries in which we live, there are certain limitations and so on, but we are usually very supportive of one another and, and one another's endeavor because in unity we're stronger. The, the senior Arctic officials that are the, 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 the people who are sent, the high level uh, people, bureaucrats from um, government are the ones that sit around the table. Mm -hmm. We, the permanent participants, are we sit at the table as well. We just don't have voting membership. That was not, 
it, they, there was a disagreement because of a consensus once again when the Arctic Council was formed. Uh, they couldn't move forward on the issue that permanent participants should have voting membership because one country once again decided no they didn't agree with that. So unfortunately that, that doesn't, um, we don't have that membership, uh, voting membership ability. But we do work very closely with our own governments as much as we can. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, I, I'm Canadian, so we have a very close working relationship with our Canadian government. And in fact, uh, we, we have uh, funding agreements with one another so that we're supported to attend these meetings as well. But the overall funding problem with the permanent participants certainly exists in terms of it's, it shouldn't be ad hoc. There should be that complete financial support for all of these permanent participants to attend all of the meetings. Yes, and, and in terms of implementation, my understanding is that um, the, the Council operates so that each nation is responsible for implementation of the Council's decisions. They're, right. They're, they do not, and it's the responsibility of the nation to, to, to judge whether they are in, in fact implementing. Right. Do you see that moving beyond that national obligation to well, a more... If it wants, if, if the Arctic Council again wants to be effective, it, it would have to function as a whole as well. I, I understandably, there are limitations within our, our nationhoods, our states, mm -hmm. but the Arctic Council is meant to be one that really deals with the circumpolar country as a whole in terms of sustainable development. So it's, it's going to have to recheck, I think, uh, it, the way it does business. And, and as again, as I say, it, this comes up whenever we, we're, we're in these times of challenge where we test the effectiveness of the Arctic Council. And I think as we go in, this year in trying to push for the follow-up of the ACIA, once again, there will be some of the, those testing grants. Okay. Uh, I want to move to a, a, another uh, agreement that you had a great deal to do with mm -hmm. uh, in terms of getting, getting started. Mm -hmm. uh, the POPs Convention. Right. Um, the World Association of Non-Governmental Organizations honored you for the key role you played in bringing about the Stockholm Convention on Persistent Organic Pollutants, which right. was signed in, in 2001. Mm -hmm. um, could, you, could you tell us what persistent organic pollutants are and why it was yes. so important to have this yes. convention? Well, in the mid-1980s, research started to show that there were these persistent organic pollutants like DDTs, PCBs, dioxins, and furans that were showing up in very high levels in the uh, cord blood and the nursing milk of our mothers in the Arctic. We realized very quickly that the source was not coming from the Arctic. They were coming from afar. And so it was a global problem and that this was going to be a, a real urgent situation because it wasn't just an environmental problem. For us, it was an issue of health. Now, to have our Inuit mothers be thinking twice about nursing their babies as a result of toxins coming from afar was very alarming. Very, very, we, felt, we thought to be, uh, it needed to be addressed immediately. So we've, we've, in those 80s, we came from a place of outrage and anger and confusion about how we and why we were being poisoned from afar to very quickly mobilizing ourselves to take part at every level what was going to happen with this issue. We were not going to start to be in a place where we were caught uh, in uh, uh, finding ourselves in a place where we, need, we were going to be choosing between our country food and our cultural heritage. We needed to know the science. We needed to know what was going to happen and what we could do about it. So we worked very closely with our Canadian government, with Health Canada within Canada. We uh, created and became board members of the Canadian Institute of uh, Nutrition and uh, Environment in McGill University that did the actual testing. We, some of our own research uh, labs were created in our regions to deal with this issue. Politically, we got very involved. And in the, mid, um, in the late uh, 1990s, when I was the chair of Inuit Circumpolar Conference Canada, I got heavily involved in the intergovernmental negotiating committee under the United Nations that started to uh, negotiate the treaty that would then eliminate these POPs at their source. And I went to every one of those sessions around the world, in Bonn, Germany, in Geneva, 
in South Africa, in Nairobi, uh, and, it, and Montreal, and that ended in 2001 in the signing of the Stockholm Convention. And what the role that we played at the ICC, I, I was the voice for all indigenous peoples in northern Canada, uh, was that we brought that, that, that sound of alarm to the world, a world that didn't even know who we were, much less what toxins were doing to our life that were coming from afar and ending up in the Arctic sink where our marine mammals eat them and then of course we are avid eaters of our marine mammals. We are hunting people, we are in the cold and the nutritious, highly uh, nutritious food that keeps us warm are the marine mammals in particular and the fatty tissues of which is where persistent organic pollutants make their home in. And so it's an issue of diet. This isn't just an issue of environment here for us. It was an issue of diet and health and that was very alarming. So we were uh, really that uh, very much a, a key voice in that process. And we always engaged in the politics of influence rather than the politics of protest. And we were rather effective. And even though we are 155,000 Inuit in the entire world, I think we were able to influence beyond our, our numbers in this, wor in this particular debate. Well, there's no question that you were far more influential than your numbers. And the, but one of the most amazing things, as you look back over the yeah. history of the development of the, of the treaty, is it may not have seemed it at the time, but for you, but how quickly it came about. Yes. Five major yes. negotiating sessions. Right. I mean, some, so many other of our major international mm -hmm. agreements uh, have taken literally decades. Yes. And yet, in five negotiating sessions, um, you were able to bring the group of nations together mm. uh, so that a significant number signed and, uh, right. and it indicated their agreement with the treaty right. in a very short period of time. And um, then ratified. And then ratified. Now, and enforced. And enforced. Yes. Now, in, 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 in less than a, f a couple of years after, yes. after the That's actual right. signing. That's right. How did that happen? In fact, in fact that accord, the, the United Nations Convention on Stock, the, the Stockholm Convention, is one of the fastest ratified, enforced UN treaties on record in history. And I think because the world saw the urgency to it, we brought in the human face to this whole process. We said that whatever is happening to our our mothers having to, uh, to deal with these issues in the Arctic, with the nursing milk of our mothers, and the poisoning of our bodies is reflection of that connectivity of everybody else in the world. And so we brought from that m on high moral ground that voice of how we are the early warning, and that, and that, bring, that will bring us to the, the discussion in a few minutes on climate change, that the Arctic is the health barometer now for the planet and that things that are happening in the Arctic is just the early warning for the rest of the world. That, that will happen very quickly for the rest of the world. And so, yes, I, I, felt, I felt very, how could you say, I had more confidence in the world then, uh, and, I, and I had more hope because the world was able to do the right thing once they knew they had a sense of responsibility to address this issue and that they felt connected to the issue. The, the way in which I think I would tell the story and intervene resonated without that wall that would, the, 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 we, not to say we didn't have challenges, I guarantee you we had challenges throughout this process, even with our own governments. Uh, but at the end, when people didn't see us as a threat, but as people who were able to add not only to the debate and say that we were net recipients of these POPs in the world, but we also had something to add. We had solutions to add. And, and we always did this by educating, informing, and not being confrontational, but being very clear and focused about these issues and how they all connect to all of us. And so we started to build the bridges. We started to build partnerships. And at the end of the day, we started to all sing from the same song sheet. But this planet is all of ours. We happen to be the ones that are being disproportionately negatively impacted by globalization because we are a people who are very connected to the hunting and the marine mammals and then the poisons that come in there. And once people started to resonate and make that connection, I think they really felt compelled to do the right thing. And so industry, 
NGOs, indigenous peoples, governments. I think the Arctic is a great bridge builder and we continue to do that. And again, we'll say a few things about that in a, mi in a minute. Good. Um, but as we move along now, four years later, yeah. uh, not every nation has in fact ratified. Right. Even some who signed right. uh, have not yet ratified, ratified. the treaty. That's right. uh, what kind of damage is this doing to, to, to the uh, problem of the POPs? Well, again, we have to take this very seriously because it's not only the dirty dozen, what we call a dirty dozen that includes PCBs and so on that are on the list of the mm -hmm. POPs treaty, the convention, but there are new toxins that are now coming into play. We are now seeing the evidence of flame retardants, for example, that are ending up in high levels in our polar bears once again. Um, and there are other new toxins that are, need to be addressed and, and put on this list of uh, POPs. So we, we shouldn't be complacent. And also some new studies that have come about very recently in Russia with our indigenous peoples would make anybody cringe at the levels of toxins that are being found there amongst our people, uh, people who are eating marine mammals and so on, and some local uh, POPs that have been found there. This is not something that we feel is a finished chapter by any means. And anyone who hasn't ratified it really must take serious uh, action to do so. And also the, the open clause that indicates that new POPs can be added to the convention is one that's very serious and we must address because, as I say, the new toxins are showing up already in our animals in the Arctic. Any particular nations that you'd like to discuss um, ratification with at this point? Well, again, you know, a, a great country like the United States that signed. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, uh, the present president publicly said, we've, rat uh, we, we've signed it and we're going to ratify, mm -hmm. but it never went beyond that, unfortunately in his first term and I would say absolutely this is absolute key to success because many of the challenges that globally that we face in the Arctic uh, the solutions lie with the United States and the United States is a powerful country that can make such incredible positive steps towards addressing these issues of environmental degradation in the Arctic and the planet and we're relying upon the, the power of the United States and the wisdom of the citizens of America to do the right thing on all of these fronts. Um, one final question on the POPs. Yes. Um, what lessons do you think can be learned from the way that you move the treaty through right. and the, then in the implementation yes. stage that can be applied to other forms of not only um, environmental agreements right. or in climate agreements, right. but other uh, international non-governmental organizational agreements? Mm -hmm. Well, um, I was saying, and I say this all the time, the POPs treaty process, th there was much learning in that process. And um, all of what we learned through that, not only how to deal with the under understanding the science of it all, but how to deal with the, our, our own local, regional organizations, our communities, and how to, to work with the world on these issues and how, uh, just where to get that snapshot of where the world is in terms of its understanding of how its actions can be um, felt from very far from the source of industry or the byproducts of industry or pesticides and all of these things. We have to start to really uh, help people to understand that connectivity issue. But that story and that work that we did a lot of it can be replicated. I am glad that we learned a lot through the POPs process because we're able to now replicate a lot of that work in the climate change work, for example. Not all of it, because we're not naive to think that it will be just simply replicating what we did and we, we, do, and we work that through with the climate change issue because the climate change issue is monumental, it's huge. There are a lot more vested players who want to keep status quo. There are powerful countries like the United States that are not signing on to the Kyoto Protocol and often are the odd man out when it comes to negotiating other forums uh, and different issues or, or different places like the Arctic Climate Impact Assessment Follow-up, uh, the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, not wanting to move forward on, on certain adaptation clauses and others. Um, those challenges exist, 
So that's a tough one to just replicate, but I am glad that we've had that experience because we're able to wade through a lot quicker and zoom in on some of the areas that need to be addressed politically to add that pressure on the United States and any other country that is uh, holding out in doing the right thing. Well, along that lines, let, let me uh, turn to a, another subject. Mm. Um, on the 7th of December this year, of 2005, yes. Uh, you, along with James Anaya and Carlos Manuel Rodriguez, the Minister of Energy and Environment of Costa Rica, filed a petition to the Inter-American Human Rights Commission in Washington, D.C. Um, mm -hmm. And that petition ch uh, talks about the violation of human rights right. by, uh, by the United States. Yes, it does. Um, would you brief us on mm -hmm. why you filed that petition and right. what you hope to, to right. get at? Well, in light of all what I have been talking about, in terms of the Arctic and the, the environmental degradation, the challenges that we have at the community level of trying to stay afloat from the first wave of tumultuous change that has occurred in our homelands, creating a real sense of a transitioning culture where our young people are the most negatively impacted, where our young men take their own lives in higher numbers than anywhere else in North America. We're having many challenges to begin with in our community as a result of these changes. We are finding that as we're coming out the other side of modernization and the, and, the, and, and the challenges that we're having, we find then we're being poisoned from afar and our climate is changing so quickly that we have not been able to keep up with how best to strengthen our community. This is a family community uh, issue. This is not just about trading of carbon sinks and emissions trading and so on. It's not just technology, it's not just politics. This is a people issue. This is a human issue. It's a humanity issue. The world has not been seeing it in that light at all. And the challenges that we have so few in number in the world to make our mark, we have been exploring ways in which we could put ourselves on the map by using the instruments that exist to protect the rights of people. So when our hunters and our elders can no longer pass down traditional knowledge that will not only guide and help our young people to survive the land, but those very skills, character skills of being able to be patient, being able to be bold under pressure, to withstand stress, to have sound judgment, how not to be impulsive, how to be wise, those very transferable skills that are going to now just be leaving us as we're just reaching in for back for them to find the solution to our communities becomes extremely at the personal family children community level so in order and 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 the world not seeing it that way and not seeing the urgency of it and in particularly the united states not seeing it as urgent as it, as it needs to be as a humanity and human level we chose to take the route of making sure that the world would see it as a human issue as, and as a result a human rights issue we have explored instruments that are out there to to try to help us do this so we went to the inter-american commission on human rights we felt that that was the best instrument to use at this time and we uh, filmed all the testimonies of our elders. We build a partnership through this process, by the way, because we worked with Americans. We worked with Earth Justice from San Francisco. We worked with the Center for International Environmental Law in Washington, uh, D.C. We worked with two young American students who actually went into our communities and videotaped the testimony of our hunters, one from Harvard, one from Dartmouth. And we worked with James Anaya, an American indigenous person specialized on human rights for indigenous peoples, who has worked at the forefront of human rights for indigenous peoples for a long time. This is the bridging, once again, of partnerships, of people coming together to do the right thing. And so December the 7th of this year, just before Christmas of this year in 2000, well, 2005, last year, uh, we launched the petition to the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. It is not a lawsuit and that must be understood. This is not a lawsuit. We are not suing for damages or for money. It has, it's not a legal uh, lawsuit in those terms, although it's a very powerful piece of legal work that weaves together uh, the voices of the, the elders and our elders, our hunters and our women, and puts it in, in, in the rights uh, debate, our right to hunt, our right to culture, our right to health, 
our right to safety, our right to home, all of those things that are in the, um, the, the human rights documents that are there to protect us is there. It is not an act of aggression. It is not confrontational. It is a very calm, uh, very cool uh, in its tone, and it is an act of generosity. It is an act of generosity from our hunters giving this early warning to the United States and to the world that this is a serious matter. It is a human issue, and it is about all of us, that it connects all of us under this planet as one. That, and that's what the intent and the tone is of this uh, petition that we have launched. Do you think it will resonate? I mean, for when, you, when you mention this to most Americans who yes. grow up on the notion of primarily yes. of human rights in terms, and immediately they think about trial by jury yes. and freedom of speech, yes. etc. Yes. Um, and I, I've tried this out in, mm -hmm. in anticipation of yes. our talking. Yeah. And you get this very quizzical look on their face. Well, yeah. what does that have to do with human rights? Right. Why, is, why yes. is that a human right? I understand right. climate. I understand yeah. right. the, uh, the other kinds of yes. violations of rights. Yes. Um, do, you, yes. do you think that this um, will resonate in a way mm -hmm. that will bring a sense of something must be done. Right. Well, first of all, it has resonated with a lot of people already. I'm not suggesting that everybody gets it yet. Mm -hmm. um, because people have a hard time even thinking in terms of, oh, ice is life and transportation. Uh, in the south where most people live, ice is like just frigid cold with no real purpose to it, um, except for people who skate on it time to time and play hockey. For us, ice is life, snow is life, cold is life. It, our culture is based on the cold, the ice, and the snow. Without that, during our winter months, there is no cultural life for us. We still hunt on the land, on the ice, and, and that is our mode of transportation. In fact, we have ice roads that, that connect communities, that connect uh, our economies together. It is really uh, an economic development issue for us as well in terms of sustainability. So not everybody has gotten it yet, but the story that I, I am keeping, that I will keep telling even beyond my term as chair is going to be that, that it is very much about a way of life that is every day. For example, you go to the supermarkets to buy your groceries. For us, the environment is our supermarket. We go on the ice, on the water, to go and get our food. Uh, and it connects us to our ancient culture, which, it, which now is, of course, as we're saying, we're finding is our, our solutions and answers lie to the despair that is happening in our communities at, the, at our young people's level. So maybe not everybody is getting it, but people mm -hmm. are starting to resonate. More and more since we launched our petition, and at, yeah, f of course, at first people go, oh, wh what is that all about? Human rights and climate change? Wh where is the sense in this? But once they start to understand that, uh, and I always say this, it, because our, our, our culture is based on ice, cold, and snow, that we are, in essence, defending our right to be cold. That's the bottom line, as Inuit. And people go, who wants to be cold? We do, Inuit. We, can, we want the snow, we want the ice, we want all of that represents life for us. And so many of the people who have been responding to me have, have responded very positively. The, I, I receive more support, email and uh, calls to, uh, in support as well as to in, invitations to speak uh, from the United States of America than I do anywhere else in the world. Has the American government responded to you yet? They haven't. They haven't. They haven't yet. Um, and uh, as the commission, I think, uh, seeks them out as well, because I think that's the process that is, is mm -hmm. going to be in place as well. Eventually, I would think that they will be responding, but we haven't had any official response or even in, in unofficial or informal responses from the government yet. No. This, the, the rights that you're claiming mm -hmm. um, are, are rights in terms of collective rights of, man, of the community, and, and, and it resonates with, with people, uh, in both indigenous as well as uh, colonial peoples, mm -hmm. and also it, there's been a big movement for indigenous and collective rights yes. um, within the African c continent. 
Sure. Have you heard Have you heard from anyone outside of the North American continent, outside of the Western Hemisphere, uh, in terms of this suit? Mm. Well, uh, we we hear from other peoples all the time. As I say, we've got the full support of indigenous peoples of the Arctic. We do hear time to time. Uh, for example, I get emails, for example, in Belize or other countries saying, we hear you opened up this dialogue in terms of environment and human rights. Can we know more about it? It's more about wanting to know what we're doing so that they themselves can start to perhaps use that channel or that avenue to start to address their issues which they feel are violating their human rights. So there is a more and more of an interest. And even with the NGO community, this petition, I think, if it does what it, it sets out to do, has potential to start to change environmental law. Uh, it has lots of um, what we call, I guess, moral suasion ability mm -hmm. to uh, even to change the politics of, uh, of things, of how things are done in the world. And that's what we hope. We're hoping that it opens up the dialogue. It's meant there to inform and educate so that um, we can build that communication with the uh, United States government and start to work through some of these barriers that exist today in addressing this very, very important issue of our planet. Yes, and on, on that, mm -hmm. um, climate change, the environment, is one, uh, one aspect of obviously the impact of globalization. Mm -hmm. uh, in one of your statements, you talked about the fact that you don't want the Inuit people to be a footnote That's to right. globalization. That's right. Um, That's what, right. What Beyond climate, which is obviously very important, mm -hmm. what other aspects would you like to address in terms of globalization, in terms of the kinds of organizational needs that we have to protect people mm -hmm. and to build uh, organizations that come from the local to the global? Mm -hmm. Well, I think it's, you know, already we're doing that. I mean, the, the Inuit Circumpolar Conference and many of the other organizations that are mm -hmm. um, uh, working with the Arctic Council and within the UN forums are very much that uh, the local organizations. I'm very connected to our, my own home communities. I'm very entrenched in my own culture uh, and having that foot in one uh, my community and, and extending out to the global mm -hmm. I think it's the, own, it's the right way to do that because then you're not disconnected with what is happening at that level and knowing what's out there on the horizon in the global community. And I think all of our institutions have much to learn about doing it this way because really it is about the disconnect that we are debating this climate change issue in the first place. And I've always said this, that it is the disconnect between ourselves and our neighbors, the disconnect between ourselves and the environment that we are in fact debating this issue of climate change. And I think the Arctic story, the Inuit story, is a compelling one where it really deals with people who are affected very much on a daily basis about what's happening globally and globalization into their everyday lives where you have to choose every day as you look out your window what you might have to do differently as a result of globalization, what you might have to eat differently as a result of globalization. It's health, it's cultural survival, all those things. But that compelling story of the Arctic and the Inuit people should be able to bridge that understanding. And that's, that is my hope for coming out in, in a strong way to defend our human rights, in a strong way to make this a human face story, a human story in a world that is just so disconnected with these issues that it is really about the future generations. And if we can create that sense of connectivity whether it be the science where Greenland, as Greenland, the ice sheet, basically a huge ice, ice sheet, is melting so rapidly, the small island developing states are sinking. And so are other parts of, including Miami and, other, and, and Louisiana and others, and we've seen what that can do. We can, we can see that the warming of the oceans are creating uh, more of a uh, more stronger energy when hurricanes come and sea levels rise. We can see that connection already starting and we're saying it's going to get worse if we don't address this issue. And so let the Arctic Inuit story bridge all of these understandings and the understanding of connectivity because you can't get clearer than that in terms of understanding connectivity even just in, in the, the, the story of Greenland melting and, every, and, and small island developing states sinking. 
That's, that's an image that everybody can relate to and understand. And so on it goes with the ecosystem. On it goes with the hun ancient hunting culture that becomes the barometer, that becomes the early warning, that becomes the, the, the sentinel uh, uh, for the planet. And that's what this is all about. It's to help the world understand that the planet and its people are one, and that if you, if you protect the Arctic, you save the planet. That's what the story is about. I'm sure this is not the end of the story for you. Mm -hmm. And so what, what is the next step? I mean, what, what can you clue yeah. us into? I mean, you've come up with an, quite a number of ways to, to bring us together, to push, push the nations, yes. to push uh, the NGOs, to, put, to push mm -hmm. industry. Where are you going next? What, what, is, what is the next mission? Personally? Personally or, and okay. collectively. Um, well, collectively, of course, we will continue to work in uh, the Inuit Circumpolar Conference. We'll certainly continue to, to work in these global forums to ensure that, um, that we Inuit of the Arctic will not be, become a footnote in the history of globalization. We are not there to be powerless victims and, and hopeless. We are there to offer solutions of, of sustainability. That will continue as we continue to bridge and build. Myself, I, I, I will be, um, my term as chair of Inuit Circumpolar Conference is ending in July. I plan to take, um, exhale a little bit, uh, and I've been doing, I will have been doing this work for 11 years, living on an airplane, going to faraway places, spending very little time uh, with people that are important to me. I have a young grandson that is very important to me. Um, who is hunting with his father and who I want to have all of this be a good future for him. So the passion is driven by the well-being of this little boy and many other little boys and girls that are in our communities. I plan to write a book um, this coming year. And yes, I will, I will be busy, perhaps not in the infrastructure of politics, which I'm moving out of for a little while, um, and still tell the story, but in another infrastructure. Um, and that's, I will continue to do that. The, the, the passion I have will continue way beyond my term uh, as ICC chair. There's, uh, you have uh, had the, the fortune of working with some excellent people mm -hmm. uh, in each of these organizations and in, in the inter-organizational work that you've done in terms of bringing together so many disparate groups and nations to, to, to the table and to get them to move towards uh, a, a practical and workable mm -hmm. solution. Um, and one of the things that I noticed in, in looking out uh, over the, um, the organizational notes mm -hmm. was that at key times, moments, you had particular nations step up foreign ministers or environmental ministers step up as champions mm -hmm. and help you and push you along. Yes. Um, did you have yes. anything to do with that step with identifying them? Did you, were you, do you think of it as lucky or do you think of them as committed? I mean, how yeah. do we find those champions that really, yeah. when you get to the international mm -hmm. state level, mm -hmm. uh, every so often you do need one of the states to mm -hmm. stand up and carry the, and carry sure. the agreement forward right. um, with the organization backing of, yes. of, of the groups, but mm -hmm. how did you find those champions? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm not quite sure which champions mm -hmm. you are uh, alluding to, but, um, well, certainly, again, it, it is to, to make people feel like um, they have that sense of connection to do the right thing. And oftentimes, I think when people really fully understand and make that connection at the human level, they want to do the right thing. They are fathers and grandfathers themselves and mothers and grandmothers. And it's very important to think in those terms that we are doing it for the children in the future. And so I have worked very closely with our Canadian government. I have worked very closely with foreign affairs ministers and with presidents of countries and so on. I've met some incredible world leaders who are very compelled to do the right thing, who believe that this is the right thing to do. Um, and I've had that honor and privilege of resonating with and working with people, leaders around the world, and I will continue to do so. Um, but I think it's, it's it, you know, wisdom or knowledge or knowing what needs to get done doesn't just lie with one group of people or with one leader. Many of us have that. 
And I think we just need to be awakened a little bit sometimes. Our consciousness has to be awakened a little bit sometimes to make that connection, to say, hey, yeah, indeed, this is a human issue. This is a humanity issue. And let's not get too caught up in the technology or the institutional, institutional way of doing things or even just the politics of it all can be just so blinding to what we need to do as leaders. And so, but as Inuit, because we are up every morning going out hunting and fishing and gathering and so connected to nature, we can't avoid that. You can't, I can't, and I can't as an elected leader avoid that at all, that this is very real, that when my grandson and his father are getting ready to go hunting on the ice, that they are assured that there is safety out there and that they're going to come home uh, with something. And I say this all the time, that as leaders, and, and as myself as a leader, we become like the hunter. You have very few uh, opportunities to make a mark, to, to be influential. So you become extremely strategic and focused, and you can't be running around in a large world like a chicken with its head cut off. You have to be very focused and very wise and have sound judgment. The, the things I talk about, the land teaches you. And, and go out there and make your mark in a way that, just like the hunter who gets up in the morning and scouts the horizon and checks the weather conditions and goes out there and comes home with something for the family because his family expects them to come home with something. I go out there in my speaking coats and my briefcases and out there and, and try to be focused and wise about what I can do to help uh, because my people expect me to come home with something that is going to be helpful to alleviate the challenges that we're facing, the monumental challenges that we're facing. And so I bring with it that, that sense of cultural heritage and wisdom that, I, that gave me that foundation to do that. And so I think there are people out there that resonate that way there are leaders. I have forged incredible bonds and, and friendships and partnerships with people who feel the same way, who are doing this for their grandchildren, whether they're American, whether they're German, whether they're South African. And um, it's, it's still, uh, in my opinion, my experience, a compassionate world that is ready to do the right thing. Well, Sheila, I'd like to thank you very much for sharing these thoughts with us and for the lessons that you've brought to us and, more importantly, for the work that you've done in alerting all of us uh, to what needs to be done. Uh, it's, a, it's a vibrant message. It's a powerful message. And I hope that uh, more of us will hear it. And mm -hmm. so thank you for being with us. Thank you for having me. Thank you.